Hey, um, we're going to go to God's Word today, and we're going to learn about friendship and how it's a power up to us. So some of you, maybe only a few, might be familiar with the movie, The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, there's a scene, let's see if we can get that on the screen. There's a scene where Frankenstein is kind of running away from everybody. He's hurt. Everybody rejects him. He's scary. He looks like a monster. He is a monster. Uh, and so he's, he's running out into the woods and he's just kind of like looking, where do I go? And he happens upon this hermit's little house and this hermit is blind. The hermit begins to sense him and hear him and right away runs out and tries to bring him into the house. He can't see him, so he's not afraid of him. And he, he starts to treat Frankenstein really well. In fact, he gets him to sit down and he begins to feed him and then he even gets him to lay down and he begins to pray and he says, God, I thank you so much that you led me to a friend. I've been asking you to a, for a friend and here's my friend. In a similar way, we're all kind of looking for friends. We're all asking the question, is there anybody like me out there? And the good news is there's lots of folks like you and there's a lot of unique contributions that you're gonna bring to them. Last weekend, we talked about relentlessness and how that's a power up and how that's a, uh, Kind of like when you eat a Mario mushroom and you, you get really big and strong. That's what the attitude, that's what the posture of relentlessness is in our lives. When we choose to take something that God wants us to take, when we choose, I'm not just going to do Christianity in the passenger seat, I'm going to be in the driver's seat so I don't find myself a little bit later in the ditch not knowing what happened. But today we're talking about the strength that we get from being in community. How do we become better friends how do we get better friends? Some of us are asking that question, how do I get better friends? And some would say, well, you know, what you do is you trade in the friends you got for better friends. It's, it's kind of like a car, okay? You're like, done with you guys, I need this kind of people. And you're done with them. Others of us might say, well, wait, you're not really gonna be able to do that, so what you really wanna do is you just want to change the friends you have into the friends that you wish they were. And so you can manipulate them and push on them and be passive aggressive and hopefully they're going to get it. This is super destructive, uh, especially when those friends are married. Uh, it is not a, a good plan. I encourage you not to do it. To make this more complicated, uh, friendship can be very hard. We've all probably experienced a little bit or a lot of bit of pain from friendships. Uh, they didn't always go well. Sometimes it's produced some resentment. Sometimes we're carrying with us stuff that we really wish we weren't carrying with us. So that's, that's a given. We're going to say that. That's true. I'm going to hopefully convince you to try again uh, by the end of this message. But what is a friend? Here's a definition that I wrote down. Friendship is a reciprocal relationship characterized by intimacy, faithfulness, trust, unmotivated kindness, and service. The way to have better friends is to be a better friend to more people. I'll say that again. The way to have better friends is to be a better friend to more people. So we're going to look at a very famous friendship. This is David and Jonathan, and they've got a super close, tight relationship that most of us, we're not going to necessarily have a ton of those, but their relationship is so instructive that God is going to teach us a lot about it. So uh, just to set the stage, so to speak, David has recently just, he just killed Goliath, okay? The whole nation is really excited about it. They're, wow, this guy, here's our hero. Um, Jonathan is also, he, he's just kind of digging David. I don't know if you've ever had the kind of relationship where right away there's kind of a responsiveness. There's a platonic attraction of like, oh, I, just, I just like them. I just want to get around them. That is what is happening with Jonathan. To be sure, they've got some stuff in common. They've both been very bold. They both love their nation. One time Jonathan, just like David was bold with Goliath, one time Jonathan scaled a cliff and with only one other one guy attacked a whole little army of people. So they have that in common, but there's also just something that God is doing in their hearts that is causing them to come together. The way to have better friends is to be a better friend we're going to see, especially in the person of Jonathan, to more people. One more thing about Jonathan is he believes or sees or understands there's been a prophecy that David is going to be the next king. Now, that's a little troublesome because Jonathan is the prince 
and the heir apparent. He should be the next king. And yet there's this prophecy going around. Nobody knows who started it necessarily, but Jonathan is aware and he is actually going to affirm David in it, even though his old man, Saul, is super jealous and doesn't want to hear anything about that. We're going to pick it up in verse one, chapter 18. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. He's like, hey, come live with us. He just killed Goliath. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped, stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. This covenant that he makes, we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but this is an agreement that they might've made in ancient times. And there's rewards if everybody fulfills what they said they would do, but there's also punishments or, or uh, you know, Negative things could happen if you don't fulfill the terms of the covenant, but they're making a covenant together. Their covenant together is not necessarily the kind of friends we all need to uh, pursue. We don't need a ton of covenant level friends. Let's talk about the different kinds of friends that we could have. I'm gonna talk about levels one through four or levels zero through three. Um, and there's a lot of other, you know, it's a spectrum guys. So, so if, this isn't gonna describe every relationship, but they're all in this spectrum. The first is zero. And that's not really friends at all. These are just people that they might be on your social media. You knew them at one point, but the truth is you don't know much about what's going on in their life and you don't particularly care about what's going on in their life. They're kind of like your online trading, trading cards. Okay, when I was a kid, I had garbage pail kids. My brother collected baseball cards. We, you know, I'd go to my friend, I'd be like, hey, have you got you know, Snotty Lottie or whatever her name is? You know, he trade me. Y'all don't know about that, man. It's a whole thing. Don't, don't worry about it. You had extras and you traded them. Um, and that's some, sometimes, like, that's the value almost of our online friends. It's like, I don't know, man. Oh, that happened? Great. I saw that you did a thing. Yeah, okay. But they're not really anything that you're thinking about after that moment. That's not real friends. That's trading card friends. Then there's casual friends. These are friends who you know about them. You probably have some casual friends here at church. Like, you know, you know something about them. You know maybe a little bit of their, maybe their job or maybe something they've achieved or maybe the sport that they like. You don't know a ton. You know, you know that's the parent of that kid that your kid, you know, plays with or whatever it, is, whatever it is. You know them and you're like, okay. You're not necessarily gonna defend them against anything. And if they try to be super like transparent and, and accountable with you, you're gonna be weirded out and vice versa. They're gonna be weirded out. Like, you're not there. You haven't opened your hearts to one another. You're just around, you know, your acquaintances. A little bit further, a little bit closer is level two. These are people that you're intentionally putting yourself around. If you're imagining you're on a boat to somewhere, these are people you're like, we're gonna be on the boat together for a while. I like to be in your life. I'm pursuing being in your life. And you know a little bit more about them. Like you might defend them because you know their heart about a lot of things. They've opened up their heart to a degree with you. You know a little bit more than just some of the circumstances. You might even know some of the pains. They've let you know some of that. They will even let you hold them accountable to a degree. Like if, if, if you see them doing something that like, man, that was weird, I saw you. Like, did you know that you did that? You just talked to your wife a really bad way in front of everybody. That was kind of weird. Uh, not, none of my business maybe, but you know, just as a Christian brother, you might wanna, you know, Maybe that's a thing to look at. But you might not go there because the relationship is not necessarily close enough for you to feel like you can do that. Then there's level three. And this is, at the, this is, this is David and Jonathan level. This is committed. This is really what every marriage is supposed to be. This is, we've come together. And instead of we're gonna ride the boat together for a little while, with these people, you're choosing which boat based on what boat they're taking. You would rearrange life to go on their boat because they're so crucial and they're so central to your life. Now, probably we don't have a ton of these, but these are, you know their goals. Like you know what they're after and you're after it with them. This is what David and Jonathan want. Like whatever you wanna, I'll, I'll take risks for you. I'll sacrifice for you. I'll probably mess up and I'll apologize to you. I'll defend you because we are that level of friend. Now, warning, everybody, is an imperfect friend. 
There are no perfect friends here on earth that you're going to get. You, you're going to have really good friends probably, but not perfect friends. Proverbs 14.10 says this, each heart knows its own bitterness and no one else can fully share its joy. Even when you're married to somebody for decades, there's the, you probably know just about everything and you've shared everything you know to share, but there, you're going to feel one way someday and they're going to be like, I don't totally get it. I'm trying to get it, but I'm not there with you. I can't totally experience it with you. And that's by design. Nobody can experience that with us. Nobody knows your heart to that level except for Jesus. He's the one who knows. And he's the one, he wants us to share it with him. Now, some of us, you're like, Carter, can I just have like a really close friend that isn't trying to change me? And can I just tell you, that's called a puppy. <laughs> that's what a puppy is. Yep. Puppies are great. But they're not going to do this. We're not, they're not human friends, right? They're going to love you no matter what, and they're not going to try to do anything. Now, here's the thing. Jesus loves you no matter what, and he is going to set you up for change because there's ways that he wants to see you conformed to his image. Come on, somebody. By the way, just so you know, when I'm like super like out of energy, the more you say amen, it's like power up. Like that's, that's feeding me a Mario mushroom right there, okay? So now here's, here's what's happening. After all this, several years goes by. And David at first is in a little bit of favor with the king, but the king grows sour and he's disliking David more and more. And he's, he gets to the point where he's trying to kill him. And first, Jonathan doesn't believe it. And then slowly Jonathan begins to see, yeah, my old man, like he's got these demons that are just making him out of his mind. He's doing erratic, crazy stuff. He's obsessed with this kid. And Jonathan is very nervous and they're having talks. They're, they're planning, what, you know, what should we do? And finally we get to it's really the last scene that they're ever gonna see one another alive. David is hiding. Saul, you know, is in Gilboa with his pop, with his, with his family. They must have some kind of like network where secret things are being communicated because even though David isn't hiding, Jonathan finds out about it and he goes to see him. Let's pick it up, 1 Samuel 23, 15. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph, at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. These, these guys have a very special relationship, and it's very empowering but there's ways all of us can grow in some of the characteristics of their friendship. They were what we could just call their power-up friends. Their friends, when you're around them, you get better and bigger and stronger. Versus necessarily folks that just, you know, they're, they're fine or maybe even they're a little bit depleting. These are power-up friends and we all need power-up friends. Now we're gonna go through these characteristics and here's what I wanna challenge you to do. The best thing to do is not to be disappointed with all the ways people weren't friends to you. That may be disappointing, and I'm, I'm sorry if that happened, but the right way to do this is we're gonna look at these characteristics and we're gonna ask, Holy Spirit of Jesus, would you show me any of these places where this year you want me to be a better friend? I'm not gonna be a perfect friend. We're not, a, guys, we don't aim at perfect in this church. Like, we're aiming at Jesus and he's gonna help us get perfecter, but we're just trying to be a little bit better. That, that's, a, that's a good goal. I'm gonna try to be a little bit better in this thing. Okay, so number one, power-up friends are open and transparent. When he says, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul, that's a metaphor for transparency. That just means, hey man, it's kind of like an open door policy. I get to see into your heart. You tell me what's really going on. This is where you don't only talk about facts or the weather or something like that. Like you talk about your feelings, when you want to, and the other person tries to understand those feelings and tries to maybe be a sounding board and walk you through that. So here's one question that some of us have got to ask. Are you living so guarded that people can't even really get to know you? Or not enough people, your mom, okay, that's fine, but, but not enough people are get, you can't really be super transparent with somebody and you're like, well, I'll just be that for them. Yeah, that's not the same thing. And over time, that's gonna still lead to loneliness and possibly resentment, which leads to pride and further uh, isolation. So we wanna watch out for that. 
Friends are not afraid to point out one another's faults. That's part of being transparent. Proverbs 27, six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of the enemy. One of the things I try to tell, tell all the groups at the Grove and fierce men uh, when we meet is, as you're in your groups, guys, go a little bit deeper than you feel like you should. Be a little bit more transparent. Push on it a little bit. And the reason for that is, I've been in like church community groups where everybody was so surfacy, And it, dude, it was bogus, man. These people were not connecting. And it was very unsatisfying. And it's like, well, what are we doing here, guys? Like either let's get, let's do this or let's not do this. So I wanna challenge everybody to be a little bit more transparent than you think maybe you should. A great place to do that, ladies, is fierce women, okay? <laughs> it's coming up this Saturday. Um, I think you're gonna have a lot of fun. It's the first one, so we're gonna figure it out. There's gonna be, there's gonna be some stuff that uh, probably gets a little bit shaped differently than fierce men, but I think we're gonna have a good time. Some of us say, yeah, but Carter, what if I don't like everything that I see? What if I'm with this person and I begin to see some of the not so pleasant parts and maybe they don't even see them? Yeah, that's a real reality. That's part of the openness and transparency. And here's what I would try to encourage you. We don't love people because they're so like us or because they do everything right. We love them because of what Christ did for us. And therefore, I try, we're, what we want to happen is I wanna see all my relationships, you wanna see all your relationships through the lens of the cross. That means between you and every relationship, there's a cross and you're saying, Jesus did this for me. He did for me better than I deserve. So for my friend, I'm gonna do better than they deserve because I'm trying to be a cross-shaped warrior. Power up friends, love us better than we deserve. They uh, love us better than we deserve. I've got some friends who, if, you know, I respect them. Kenzie and I like them. If they come over, you know, we wanna make a good impression. We're gonna clean up the house. It's gonna look nice. We've got some friends that we've known a little bit longer. Maybe we've been a little bit closer to. We're so close that if we don't have time to clean the house, we're like, it's only them. You know what I'm saying? You're close enough that it's like, dude, you've already seen inside my soul. So this family room is fine. You'll be, you know, no, there's no surprises for you. But let me ask you this question. This year, would you say, you think the Holy Spirit would say, are you loving at all the opportunities you have your friends better than they deserve? Because that's the call. It's not just to love them for how they've done. It's better than they deserve. Here's number two. Friends are constant in hard times. They're constant in hard times. And Jonathan rose and went to David at Horesh. Now, scholars will tell us that Gilboa and Horesh, they were about 30 to 40 miles apart, okay? So that's long on foot. Uh, in those times, you could, you could, on a great day, you could make it 20 miles on foot if everything was great. But this is probably lots of difficult terrain. And he's probably going in stealth mode, okay? Because... He doesn't want anyone to know that he can't just walk out there. The king will follow him. So he's trying to get to his friend and it's taking many days, maybe through lots of difficult things to get to his friend because he's constant, because he's faithful. He's trying to get to him. A really interesting idea just to, to ponder this. At the beginning of David's hardships, okay, he beats Goliath and then there's, there's a period of hardships in David's life. All the way up until really he becomes king until Saul is dead. In, in between those hardships is all that trial and it's bracketed with the friendship of Jonathan. It's bracketed with the friendship of Jonathan. It starts with Jonathan and it ends with Jonathan. I wonder if that just means that there are certain friends God sends us to because they're gonna go through a season and God's like, I want you to be a help in that season. They're gonna go through some stuff and I sent you, the Lord sent Jonathan and he sent you to be a Jonathan in their life. See, I believe we're all called to be Jonathans to somebody. And that's gonna take, sometimes it's gonna take constancy and faithfulness and traveling a little, little further and doing it a little harder and shutting some things down. And I think it might be helpful for all of us to think about, there might be some people, cause you're like, well, yeah, maybe I could do that, but I'd like some people to do that for me. Yeah, for sure. But consider this, there might be some people 
that already are doing that for you. They're loving you way better than you're knowing about or that you're appreciating. There's some people that God has put in your life and, and to be honest, and we've all done this, you kind of take them for granted. And the truth is there's things they don't even bring up and they're crushing it, being faithful to you. And we ought to do our best to give them a high five every now and then. Be like, I am so blessed that you are my friend. Yeah, I like seeing spouses high five each other. That's really dope right there. Here's some things that shouldn't keep us from our friends from fellowship, it's shame. When we're feeling bad about ourselves, I'm too sinful, I messed up too much this week, I can't go to fierce women because they're all holy girls and I'm not. And that, you, that's, that's the enemy, dude, okay? Those gals are gonna strengthen you, they're gonna super Mario you, okay? They're gonna make you better. And they're not gonna shame you because Jesus doesn't shame you. Sometimes people are isolating themselves and, and here's, here's the, the tragedy Guys, I get it. Like sometimes you hear, about, you hear about an event and you're like, I can't go there. There's people there. <laughs> That's the last thing I want. We can come here, you know, because no one's really gonna talk to me and we're gonna be, I'm gonna raise my hands and sing. And, but there's people at that thing. <laughs> yes, there are. We'll all take the challenge, okay? That's hard for a lot of us. But consider they're the people that we have to practice loving on. Who else are you gonna love in life except for your friends? Here's something we don't think about. Whether we like it or not, guys, when you die and Jesus greets you, he's gonna do a review of sorts, okay? He's gonna lay out all your stuff. Just like if you were ever in junior high and you did the science fair and you had all your little you know, solar system stuff or whatever you brought, cup of dirt, whatever it was, you brought that and you, you laid it out there and the teachers came by and they were like, what is this? Well, there's a version of that that's gonna happen with Jesus. And he's gonna see, well, there's trinkets here and there's fears here and there's you know, stuff that, that doesn't matter here. We have way better than that. That doesn't matter. That's just an earthly thing. And there's gonna be some love. And he's gonna be like, that's what counted. That's what I was looking for. And we want that moment to go as best as it possibly can. And if we're always isolating, we're just not gonna have the opportunities to get more on that table. Are we hearing that? And guys, I get it. I get tired and it's hard sometimes to engage. But who else are you gonna love, man? If not those people, that it's gonna take a little work to get around them. Good job saying amen. The way to have better friends is to be a better friend. To more people. I want to encourage us to ask Jesus for faithful friends and to ask him also for friends he's asking you to be faithful with. See, we all want like, give, give me some levels two and three friends. That's what I want. Awesome. And some catered, especially for you. There's years that my wife and I do, we just didn't have any friends. And we're like, Jesus, I don't know what to do. Give us friends, please. And then we would pray for mentors. And over the years, not over the weeks, the Lord began to raise up friends that were just awesome and mentors that were just awesome. But we had to ask. And so I want to encourage you, ask. Ask for some deep people that you'd choose the boat with them. But then also ask the Lord to choose some people. You, he wants you to get on their boat and be faithful because you're bracketing a season of their life that they're really going to need you or the special kind of Jesus that comes through you. Power up friends, strengthen us in the Lord. He rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, you shall be the king over Israel and I shall be next to you. How do we strengthen one another? One of the ways that we can do that, see everyone's going through trials, everyone's going through difficulty sometimes, just like David was. And Saul tells him something that David probably believed, but it was hard to believe sometimes. Or sorry, Jonathan. Jonathan is, is coming along to encourage him this. And he just says, David, if you're weak in your faith, let me be your faith right now. I'm gonna believe. So when you've got difficulty in your job, a friend comes along and says, hey man, I know it's shaky right now and you're discouraged, but I believe. 
that God is gonna get you through that thing. I mean, he's gonna raise you up and you get beyond that thing or you're wrestling with sickness and you just feel really bad and someone comes along, they put their arm around you and say, hey man, I know it's hard. I'm praying and believing for your healing. Maybe your believer's all worn out, but I'm gonna believe for you. Guys, we need to believe for one another and we need to tell one another, hey, don't worry about the faith thing so, so much right now. I'm believing for you. I'm praying for you. And Jesus is gonna do this for you. He's gonna work it together for your good. So a friend believes God's best over us when we don't. And a friend, us, believes the best over others when they don't. And they encourage one another in the will of God. That's what, that's what he did. He said, look, David, this is gonna happen. I want you to remember that you're going to do this. We get to do that too with something even more powerful, God's word. See, people forget the words of God. They forget what God says about them. And we get to come alongside. And when people are going through trials and difficulties, can I just tell you, I'm gonna give you a pastoral a uh, uh, little hack here, okay? You, you, get, you, you get in conversations with people and you're like, I don't know what to do. They're just telling me the problems. I don't know what to do. Here's a great step one. First pray, Lord, give me something. Give me something here. <laughs> <laughs> but step two is, Lord, what is the scripture that they need? Because it's the scripture that strengthens us. The scripture is the word that they, that they need to believe. Maybe you need to believe for them. God, give me scripture. And sometimes when you don't even know that, we, you know, it's, it's so like, all you can do is just bleed with them. Be like, oh, I don't, I don't know. But I just, God's word is true and it's still true for you. And I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's still true for you. What do we do? We're gentle with their pain. If we're a good friend, we genuinely appreciate all that they are, but then we point them back to God's word. And sometimes that means we point them back to obedience Really, all of us do this. We're trying to walk around obedience. We're like, I don't know what to do. Did God tell you this? Yes, but I think there's another way. No, <laughs> go back to when you last knew what you were supposed to do and go ahead and do that thing. Power up friends, here's the last one. Relinquish their robes. They relinquish their robes. It said in verse four, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. Giving him his robe was saying, David, this is a princely royal robe that I'm putting on you. Because even though my old man doesn't like it, and even though my flesh might not like it, and it means I'm not gonna get all the enrichments and all the gifts that I was going to get, I know what God wants, and he wants this. And I'm willing to give you my robe, I'm gonna strip myself, and you're gonna be the king of Israel. You're gonna be the defender of the nation. You're gonna be the one that is viewed as the one who protects all of us. That's a really big deal to lay down our rights, things that we have a right to for our friends. I wrote it down this way. Power up friends, say, I want you to be everything God is calling you to be, even if it costs me personally. I want you to be everything that God wants you to be, even if it costs me personally, even if I have to contribute to it, even if it costs me time, it costs me money, it costs me sleepless nights, whatever it costs, whatever I can do, however I can get you to that, I wanna be a part of that because it's a privilege. And here's where we see, as Jonathan is a picture, he's, he's a type of Jesus. See, Jesus is the king. He comes down off his throne and takes off his robe and he puts it on us. He says, I came from heaven so that you can wear the robe of righteousness. I came from heaven off my throne so you can share my throne with me later on. I came with my crown of righteousness to give it to you so that you would have the righteousness of God in Christ. That's a deep surrender for Jesus. So in some way we could say, meaning it the right way, during that bracketed time, God used Jonathan to save David in a lot of circumstances. The same way, only much fuller and deeper and more meaningful, God uses Jesus to save us from our sin, our foolish mistakes. God covers us all kinds of times that we don't even know. I mean, just think about how many times God has had your back and you, like you even prayed for something. You're like, well, there it is. And it was something little and you're like, well, there it is. And it's almost like God bothered with that. And yet he did. Why? Because he's your friend or he withheld something from you. And later on you saw, doggone, that was smart, dang. 
sorry to be complaining about that. Because why did he do it? He did it because he was your friend. Jesus is the faithful friend that always treats us better than we deserve. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. If we want to be a good friend to Jesus, the first thing we need to do is say, Yes, sir, I will obey you. I will aim to be a good friend the way these guys are, the way Jesus calls me to, in your power. I'll do what you command. He said, you're, you're my friends. He says, I'm already your friend. You're being my friend when you do what I say. And then he says, it's so awesome. I've made known to you all that I heard from my father, I've made known to you. The second thing we wanna do as Jesus' friend is talk to him, get in his word, have this thing called a quiet time. Get that down, man. Get the discipline it takes, whether you're starting at five minutes or 45 minutes, where you are listening to God and going into his scripture because that's where he's making known to you all that the Father has said. It's right there. You have all that the Father has said in written form that Jesus wants you to know. Jesus, I'm your friend. I want you to know this, but you gotta come spend time with me. And guys, we need it. We need it. And we need it really badly. And here's why. Because at the end of the day, you and I are all Frankenstein monsters. We're all stitched together contradictions, right? Like we like this thing over here, but we also like this thing over here and it kind of opposes that. We can be super arrogant one moment and yet we're, then we're like super down and depressed about how bad we are at something the next moment. We can choose all the wrong things for ourselves and then be so good at choosing for other people. We are walking contradictions and what we really need, like Frankenstein was wandering around looking for a friend. We're wandering around life looking for friends. And Jesus says, what you need is you need a master friend. You need the ultimate power up. You need Jesus to be your master friend because he's the one who completes. You remember we said, no one is really gonna know your heart except Jesus. He's the one who completes you. He's the one that's gonna make your friendship work and help others. He's the ultimate friend. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we, uh, it's so incredible to think about. We were out looking for a friend. We were out looking for you, but you were already out looking for us. Thank you. God, we want to ask for healed hearts and hurts where we've been hurt by friendships. Maybe something just didn't go right and it ended weird and abruptly and there's maybe even some business to do or maybe not. Maybe we're just supposed to delete it and move on. Whatever that is, God, I pray that you would heal it in such a way that we can look back and say, that was real, but it is healed. And then, God, would you show us the people you're calling us to be Jonathans to? People we're called to walk through seasons of life and be on the same boat and sometimes even choose the same boat. God, we put ourselves, we are clay in your hands. In Jesus' name.